Okay, so uh, I would like also to start by thanking the organizers for being here and for letting me speak in this meeting. And uh, as you know, quantum turbulence is not new. It's been uh, uh, surged for many decades, mostly in helium, helium-4, helium-3. But it turns out that condensates uh, places a very nice uh, platform for investigation of this phenomenon because we can control density, we can control interaction, we can work uh, homogeneous and non-homogeneous system, we can go low dimension, three dimension. So it seems to be a very nice platform for this kind of study. And uh, what I'm going to be telling you in a couple of, uh, in the next minutes is how we are doing experiments to approach understanding a little better quantum turbulence. Okay, well, let me start by showing the, the most important part of my laboratory, which are the people involved, and I have students, researchers, postdocs, and, of course, collaborators all around the world, and uh, uh, they all contribute very much for the things I'm going to show to you. As you know, turbulence is all around us, and most part of the turbulence that people care about is this. Of course, uh, we are all very much interested in disorder in quantum system, but uh, speaking about turbulence, people want to understand uh, from the universe to uh, geophysics to, of course, life. As you know, uh, you, you could not be here today if it wasn't turbulence, because uh, life, the way it is for us humans, depending on turbulence. When you breathe, only the turbulence of the air can make the exchange of gas, the circulation of blood. And somebody told me that now the brain has parts of laminar flow of blood and parts of turbulent flow of blood. Anyway, it seems to be very important. But even though we, we know very little about, people know the equations for many times. It's been already more than a century, I think. We build up equations. The problem is it's a hard problem, and we cannot predict what's going on in there. So remain unsolved for the days. Because uh, turbulence in the, in the superfluid is related to eddies and vortices, uh, I'm going just to show you that uh, in the superfluid, when we have a vortice, when we imprint rotation on it, it means that the circulation is quantized. So this is a very important feature. And uh, the core of the vortex is related to the interaction and the density. Right? This is what's called the healing length. And the people have been generating vortices in condensates from the very beginning of condensates. And normally they crystallize. We all know this. And we see some talks already in this conference. And, uh, but normally, you produce vortices in a single circulation in a single sign, when you produce vortices and anti-vortices, or vortices in many directions, they can react and can produce a very chaotic kind of uh, configuration that we call tangle, configuration of vortices, which somehow we call quantum turbulence. This name, quantum turbulence, is very debatable. Some people like, some people don't. This has been predicted long ago by Feynman. And, uh, in a helium, right? So when you produce this configuration, you have many vortices, filaments, the way we call. And when they interact with each other, they react, they produce rings, they produce oscillations. And this kind of very uh, disordered system is what we call quantum turbulence. If you go to the condensate, on the other hand, it's a little different. You know, it's smaller size. Vortices are bigger because density is smaller, so the core is bigger, and we should be able to reach turbulence in a lower number. And this uh, somehow gives us some uh, advantage uh, 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 when we compare with the liquid helium. Just for give you a kind of uh, a parallel, this is classical turbulence, and this is the quantum. And if we look at vorticity, for instance, in the classical turbulence, vortices can be anything, can be continuous. So you can have a, a rotation of any kind, from small value to very large values. When you go to the superfluid, this is discrete and quantized, as I showed to you before in the slide before. And this is the key point 
that make people interested in using quantum turbulence try to understand the turbulence phenomena as a whole. Because here, you know, the filaments will not have be anything. The vortices will be quantized with a single circulation. Therefore, much be easier to understand it than you have a full spectrum of possibilities of circulation. And there are many other things that are involved. Uh, in the classical one, we have a single fluid. Uh, here, we have two fluid models, as you know. Here, we have dissipation. And here, as you're going to see, we, we, the energy has to go somewhere and end by going in a cascade to sound waves and so on. That is one also how we quantify turbulence. In the classical fluid, we quantify by the Reynolds number. But uh, here, uh, we, we still have a hard time to quantify. People say that the best way is quantify the amount of turbulence we have by the length of the vortex. But as you know, I may have a very well organized lattice of vortex. So this is already not a good quantity. So people have been investigating for decades turbulence in the, in the quantum fluid, helium mainly, and trying to, because it's discrete, less vortices and things, maybe we could understand a little better and export to the classical fluid what we learn. When we go to Bose condensate, it is, uh, we think that, oh, this is just another superfluid, but it's not. It goes much beyond uh, the, the helium. And why? It's because uh, here, turbulence can be reached with a small number of vortices. We have a large surface. And uh, vortice spacing is not so big. Uh, we can have uh, different uh, dimensions to study, and uh, we can adjust interactions and density in a much easier way, and we can mixture fluids, superfluids as well. So it seems to be very interesting, and people got that, and there are many experiments going on. You know, I think uh, we have experiment in the United States by Brian Anderson, which he's doing the 2D, mostly 2D. They produce a 2D superfluid, punch a... a a vortice and try to understand the dynamics and everything. We have also Chris Helmerson in Australia, and we have here in Korea uh, the chairman of the section also doing 2D. In 3D, this is still starting, I think. As far as I know, that is our group in Brazil, and that is now a group uh, from England, Navon from Cambridge, that's starting to do some of the experiment in a box type of uh, BEC. And of course, theory is being many, many groups. I, could, I did not list all because maybe you can find the one theoretician in each city doing the theory of the, turb the quantum turbulence. We started this about six years ago, and uh, we have done many of those things. And I, instead of keep citing the papers, I, I, all the list of our publications is in our home page. And if you visit, you can see uh, some other of the experiments we're doing too. So please do it. And uh, I'm going now in this talk, instead of speaking about all, I'm just going to make a short revision of things we have measured, and then I'm going to just concentrate in a few of those new things. We have a rubidium 87 condensate, and this is the one we do the experiment. So normally the condensate has about 10, 3, 10 to the 5 to 5, 10 to the 5 atoms in the condensate phase, and this is the sample we do the experiment. We have a new experiment on the mixture of sodium potassium, with the idea is to get an extra knob on this by uh, controlling and transferring vorticity and everything. You know, the main thing about quantum turbulence is that you start with energy in large scale, basically the size of your system by putting the, the vortices and this, this thing cascade down. So vortices normally interact in cascades like Richardson or Kelvin waves cascade. So they start to interact and energy start to go to a small scale, large momentum, and then uh, dissipate like funnels. Our experiments start by exciting the condensate. So we produce condensate, you know that, and then we do an equivalent to atomic washing machine where we excite by introducing uh, deformation and tiny rotations on the potential and uh, we produce the condensate, we excite for a while, what we call time of excitation, and then we hold, and then we do a time of flight to observe, and we generate vortices, we proliferate vortices, and we, then we make the cloud to be turbulent with vortices and anti-vortices reacting, 
and giving to the sample special properties. You know, just to summarize uh, everything we observe, when we excite it, this is time of excitation, amplitude of excitation. Of course, if you do tiny shaking of this, you see the scissor modes, which is basically a consequence of the superfluidity of the condensate. But sooner, in a large region of, uh, of our universe of parameters, we punch, we make the, the, we nucleate the vortices, and then the vortices, if we react and go to a turbulent regime, and if we keep putting energy on it, we go to a, what we call a granulation, which is we break in domains, and this kind of observation has been simulated by Tisubota in Osaka City and his group, and also in Dubina by Yukalov and his group, and it seems to be okay, and everything can be explained. One of them says that we need some dissipation for this to happen, and the other one say, no, we don't need, just gross beta Fs is good enough, and uh, well, it's things to be seen. Just for you to understand what's happening is I start to put vortices in my system, the number of vortices grow, suddenly I start to have a hard time to generate more vortices as I pump energy, right? And uh, so this is the point where no more vortices can be put inside the cloud. This is a finite size cloud, vortices has some dimension. And then uh, any energy I put, I think I force all the vortices to react and then uh, they evolve. If I keep putting energy sooner, all the vortices disappear and I go to this granulation that I call which is basically a transition to wave turbulence and then maybe formation of domains of superfluid. Okay, this is a kind of nice picture of going from vortices in the cloud to turbulent or going to the turbulent to this granulation regime. One way of seeing this is just, as you know, the Gibbo-Zurich mechanism, when you quench, you know, you, you have a, this is very interesting when you go to the condensate, if you quench very fast, you generate vortices and then the system goes and equilibrates. This is a sequence of things that happens when I go through the, through the uh, formation of the condensate. I have regions of condensate and then I, get, I have a domains, what I call grains, and then vortexes, vortex state, and then I end it by having the equilibrium BC. I think that uh, what we're doing is the opposite. We call the inverse Zurich scenario, we, the inverse Gibbo-Zurich scenario. So I start with the equilibrium BEC, and by putting those excitations, I go to a strong non-equilibrium state. So basically what I do, and these are the pictures, I make vortices, and then vortex turbulence, grain turbulence, and finally wave turbulence. Okay. When you speak about turbulence, everybody wants to know the spectrum, how the energy is distributed, and uh, because this is the most important thing people know in turbulence, which is the Komogorov spectrum in a range of momentum. So we want to know how the energy is distributed in momentum. And normally, in a range, we have this uh, momentum to the minus 530, which is called Komogorov relation for the energy spectrum. And uh, this is when the energy is flowing in scale by those cascades, and the most important one in condensate, I think, is the reconnection of vortices. And, uh, well, we have to measure this, and then we have measured, and how you measure momentum distribution in a condensate, you do time of fly, and then you're gonna think, oh, but interaction kills you. But when you have a turbulent cloud, most part of the energy is in rotation. So when I let expand mostly what I'm measuring, the spectrum containing the rotation, and uh, this is what we have done, just let expand in different times, seeing the amount of atoms in different momentum, and then, but I'm projecting because I do absorption, then I have to do a transformation to recover the 3D distribution of momentum. And we have done this. This is when you have either the condensate or a few vortices, but as soon as you evolve to turbulence, all the momentum, all the energy seems to go to the large momentum, it means small scale. And uh, we get here a region that's very interesting. And uh, if you just transform, do the transformation now, and uh, what you get here, this is the 2D, this is the 3D. When you recover by the uh, transformation, you get a momentum, and you get a part here which is in the right scale, which is basically the scale corresponding to the intervort separation and the vort core scale and you get a kind of power law, but as you can see, I have less than one decade of, uh, of uh, scaling 
length scale to deal with, which I think is not enough to really uh, swear that uh, we're seeing this. But of course, theoreticians already getting power law like this for this regime. In terms of uh, evolution of disorder in your system when you're doing this, you know, you can evaluate the differential entropy. And basically, when the, correlation, when the normalized correlation length goes down, you start to have the disorder. So I, still, I keep putting energy in here, and suddenly the disorder starts to grow. And I think this is the moment where the turbulence start to build up and develop it. OK, so and what is very interesting is if I excite and stop, it's still the disorder evolve a little bit. So the energy is being rearranged inside and uh, building up more disorder in your system. That is one very nice observation that we did from the very beginning. As you know, a thermal cloud expanding, reaching an isotropic kind of form that is no inversion ratio. A condensate, pure condensate, when you let it expand, that is an inversion ratio. You know, as you know, whatever is squeezed, expand faster, then you have an inversion ratio. But when you have a turbulent cloud, neither of these, we call this self-similar expansion. This is being well explained by Alex Fetter and our group. Uh, if you have an angular momentum distribution, random distribute, you reach uh, this kind of self-similar. But of course, this is uh, uh, one way of looking. And there are other uh, phenomena in nature where that happens. So this is just for you to see a normal condensate expanding. So I'm plotting here the two uh, dimensions. So you see the inversion aspect ratio. And this is the turbulent cloud. That is no inversion ratio. And that is another place in nature where that happens, which is a speckle. If you look at a coherent uh, laser beam that you produce a speckle and let propagate, that is no more inversion like this. So this is our turbulent cloud. This is a speckle field. And for the speckle field, if you let a speckle field propagate, also, there is no inversion. A coherent beam, when propagates, of course, if you have an elliptical shape, it inverts the, the same way that a condensate. But the speckle field doesn't. So we want to make a similarity because we understand what's going on. You know, when you have a coherent laser, the divergence goes with the, the wavelength divided by the waste. And of course, whatever is more exquisite, you have bigger divergions. And then you have the inversion. When you have a speckle field, the divergence goes with the wavelength divided by the coherent length. And since the coherent length is basically equal everywhere, it means that these diverge in a self-similar way, like the way you see. And uh, I mean, this is the expansion of a BC and a turbulent BC, and this is the propagation of uh, a coherent optical beam uh, with and without speckle. And of course, there is a big similarity. And I think uh, they are basically equivalent phenomena because expanding BEC is like a matter wave propagating. And the presence of this disorder uh, obeys equivalent to the speckle field. So we just measure the, the density density correlation on this because uh, this is some way of showing that uh, if they are equivalent, they should have equivalent density, density, or intensity, intensity correlation. And we have measured that. And as you know, the density, density correlation for the pure condensate or for a pure Gaussian beam is one. But when you have the disorder, it is bigger. And as you go to larger uh, distance, it decays to one. So we measure this for the condensate and for the light beam. And of course, they are very equivalent. This is expanding now turbulent BC. And I think that is uh, very interesting because they basically wave phenomena in the same nature. A uh, turbulent cloud of BC expanding is exactly like a propagation of a speckle field. Why is this important? Well, first of all, I think now we are merging quantum turbulence with statistical arm optics. Speck of matter waves in 3D is something that people want to do many things, and I think this is an example they could come and study a 3D speckle field for a turbulent cloud of BEC expanding. And of course, we can map one phenomenon to the other, which I think this is when we're going to win, because we know more about speckle fields than we know about turbulent BEC. 
so we can map one in the other in, during the expansion to understand some of the statistics going on. So this is what we're doing. Now we are doing some other things, which is generating a giant vortex in the BEC and let the decay. And the hope is that in some specific condition, we may spontaneously evolve to a turbulent regime on the BEC. And we have done the first experiments producing by phase imprinting a giant vortex in the BEC. We work with N equals four because it's the easiest way when you invert the bias field. And then these vortex decay in four, and then you start a, a twisted, unwinding kind of configuration. And in some specific situation, uh, this will evolve to a turbulent because they're going to react. And uh, these are the first experiments, this experimental data that we are seeing. Uh, and at the very beginning, I, 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 I hope here I have a simulation in a situation that's tiny different. But when you decay the vortices in a, in a condensate, they may evolve and have all this reconnection of, uh, of the vortex lines and evolve to turbulence. If that works, that will be very good because it means that we are we're going to be able to uh, easily generate a turbulent cloud and uh, uh, do experiment with this. There are two things we want to measure. One is the compressibility of a turbulent cloud, and the other one is the retardation or attenuation of sound speed when you have uh, those very uh, high excitation on the condensate. But uh, of course, even though local density approximation is very good, you can imagine how uh, uh, hard it is to apply local density for a turbulent cloud. So we are developing what we call a global variable thermodynamics, specifically to measure the compressibility and the speed of sound in those systems. And uh, we have already measured compressibility to prove that is very well and in the, condens in the pure condensate. And also, yeah, we have measured the speed of sound in a range of temperature just to legitimize the technique of the global variable to be able to, I'm going to jump to this, be able to uh, measure in the turbulent cloud. OK, just to, to conclude, uh, I think uh, we're seeing a wide range of turbulent phenomena in BC. And I think many is unknown. You know, when I build that diagram and you see domains of uh, structure, that's already a very interesting. I don't think it's trans suddenly transition from vortices to turbulence. It's a more smooth kind of crossover. But uh, that is a kind of evidence of finitude, finite size system. You know, finite size superfluid. You put the, the vortices, you, you, you nucleate many vortices, suddenly you cannot put any more, and all the energy is to push this system to react and to evolve to a very disordered uh, configuration, which is the turbulence. Uh, I think this aspect of uh, make a comparison between speckle and uh, turbulence is also very interesting. You know, it generates many possibilities for us. And uh, because we always going to have to expand it, to let the condensate to grow a little bit, to see details and to see things. And whatever is this uh, characteristic of the expansion can reveal to us a lot of the order short range and everything that is in this uh, system. And of course, the big question, because the main motivation to study uh, turbulence in superfluids is try to understand the phenomena as all in general. And uh, of course, it's always very nice to introduce uh, disorder in quantum system as well, because uh, always is unexpected what you can get. But uh, the question is if, it quantum, if the quantum fluids may hold the key to unlocking the underlying physics of, of fluid turbulence. And, uh, and my answer is yes. We just need to go much further. People already seen individual reconnection of the vortices, like Ferrari and from Italy that show a poster, very nice. And I think uh, by knowing, knowing those individual elements that build up the turbulence, maybe it will be easier to understand what's going on then going to the opposite direction with a very heavy computation that we see the system evolving and uh, we don't understand the individual parts of it. And so I, I, I really think that uh, both condensates, superfluid mixture and many things would be wonderful. We are now putting together sodium and potassium 
hoping to do big condensate of potassium, to have more dimension to explore, more decades in the spectrum I showed to you, and also to have an extra knob because I can control the interaction and maybe transfer vorticity from one fluid to the other, or maybe even explore many models of turbulence in the presence of the two fluids, very density and all kinds of things. So I think it's a very promising uh, field, and I, I, I hope uh, the number of groups working in this field is growing, and many people in helium are now paying attention to the condensates because it may be a very nice workbench to find out uh, many answers for long-lived questions in this field. Well, my time is over, so I thank you very much, and if I can answer some questions, please, I'll be here for. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, questions and comments? Okay, actually I have uh, one question. Uh, how can you experimentally distinguish from the so-called grain turbulence uh, to the, the vortex turbulence? You mentioned about the grain, grain turbulence and the vortex turbulence. Can we experimentally distinguish between them? Yeah, I think those uh, correlation type of thing and the evolution will be able to let us understand if we have a superfluid turbulence, which is this tangle of vortices, or we have this grain turbulence or wave turbulence, which is big fluctuations of the density, you know, a mixture and scattering of nonlinear waves, which is also a very important phenomenon. Unfortunately, they all behave the same. They always take to uh, equivalent things in superfluid. And, uh, but I think we, we are able, if we, if we know, if we let expand and we do the you know, correlations, uh, measurement and things, we'll be able to distinguish between both. I'm trying to find out an equivalent to a Reynolds number to quantify, because if we can do that, it's like in the normal fluid, they can more or less identify regimes and things. And, but, uh, you know, Brian Anderson proposed a, a kind of Reynolds number, but uh, it, uh, I don't know how is the start of measuring this. Because, uh, but everybody's now thinking, how can we identify and separate those kind of regimes? Unfortunately, they have the same momentum dependence in, some, in different regimes, so in different evolution of the turbulence. So just looking the power law, we're not gonna help us a lot, but uh, correlation, me. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes. Vandali, you, you showed the analogy between uh, the expansion of the BC with, uh, with, uh, with rotation. So you, you imply that you have vortex and, and things like that, and the speckle field. But in the speckle field, there is no obvious rotation, analogous rotation. So up to what kind of hypothesis can you map, make this correspondence with speckle propagation and time of flight of a BEC? Oh, okay. In which domain, you know, can I, no, I think, uh, trust uh, this mapping? Yeah, the domain I am, when I am comparing, I'm already in the end. So I'm already in the wave turbulence kind of regime where you have those domains, big fluctuation of intensity equivalent to the speckle. So this is the region where we are comparing. Okay, but, but the, uh, uh, the tangle of vortices is a, is a previous regime. So do you have different power law in this regime than in the grain? Oh, but they decay, term? right? All these are going to decay. So all these vortices will decay in those domains and a, a lot of random phase is distributed to the corners. Yeah, yeah. So the, the mapping is valid in the... Uh, yeah, in the, I think uh, uh, the final, mapping... Well, I mean, this, is, this mapping yeah. is only good for the expanding cloud. But uh, to do some statistics and things, I think is very fair. So the comparison may help. But this is still very new, right? I mean, we may find out that there are limitations. We, we cannot apply that. Uh, suppose I have a single vorts or a few vorts in the, and let expand. That's not equivalent to... So uh, uh, there will be regimes where we can uh, make comparison and equivalence of the two uh, propagating waves, matter waves and light wave. Uh, 
any other questions? Okay, then let's thank the speaker once again and then move to the next.